You're listening to the Monday Night Community Show with Daniel on BRFM. This is the Daniel Monday Night Community Show on demand through YouTube. Thank you very much for choosing to listen to us through this method. If you'd like to keep up to date with when I add new interviews, then subscribe to this channel. We present Bread and Circuses by John Fryer with Mark Hill and Katie Williams as Terry Ann. President Martin. President-elect Doyle. It is good to see you. I know this must be difficult for you, and... For me? You're not going to tell me you're glad not to be serving a second term? Not at all. I made my pitch, and the American people made their decision. Democracy in action. If you can't play by the rules, don't enter the game in the first place. Well, that is very big of you. Isn't it? Uh, tradition dictates that we meet, Mr. President. And dictates are what you learn in this office. I'm sorry? The pressures of this office, its history, its perceptions by those outside of the White House. No one you meet will ever understand the various pressures that you alone will face over the next four years. And some of those pressures will weigh heavily upon your shoulders and your conscience long after you leave these walls. Are you trying to tell me something, Mr. President? Something not in the records? I failed. Not on one day. I just stopped fighting. I came to believe that the world view of the power and majesty of the presidency was just that. Your criticisms of me during the campaign, of my mistakes, were real and correct. I let the people down on a number of occasions, but that was nothing to how much I compromised and accepted solutions that I believed were far from perfect, things that I knew were wrong. No one can fight on all fronts, so the secret is the system doesn't let you. And if you change the system, it will fight right back. I know that right now, you and your staff want to change the world. You shouldn't be here if you don't want to. The world doesn't want to be changed. It just wants to be managed. And they all need someone to blame. Remember that, Mr. Doyle. There must always be someone to blame. Panem et circenses. Remember the words of Decimus Lunius Juvenalis. Give them distractions, Mr. President. Give them distractions. And watch your deputy. She's much smarter than you. It is a beautiful day here in Washington, D.C. January 20th. Swearing in of the next President of the United States will take place at 12 noon. The latest incumbent to hold the office since the first President, George Washington, in 1789. Today is a day of parades, dinners, speeches, and social events. Those in attendance will be members of Congress, Supreme Court justices, members of the military, former presidents, dignitaries from around the world, and Medal of Honor recipients. And of course, an audience of hundreds of millions from around the world. Chief Justice Castillo will be administering the oath of office as mandated in Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution. President-elect Doyle, we are told, has decided to use the Lincoln Bible for the ceremony. And, after the oath has been taken, the Marine Band will perform ruffles and flourishes, as well as hail to the chief. There will then be a 21-gun salute from the Presidential Gun Salute Battery. Following the oath, the Congressional Luncheon will take place at the Congress, after which the newly appointed President, Harrison Doyle, will walk from the Capitol building along Pennsylvania Avenue to the White House and his new home for the next four years. Tomorrow, the President and the new First Family will attend a prayer service at the Washington National Cathedral. Now Vice President Leg Baker will actually take the oath first, as is the traditional protocol in these days. Well, everyone, we're almost there. Two months after the election, we have our mandate from the people. This is our time. 
I hope you will all continue to work as hard for those who sent us here as you did on the campaign when we sought their votes. It has, after all, been said by many that there is a difference between making promises and leading here in the capital. The enthusiasm, some might even call it dreams, that fueled us all during the race should be left behind and forgotten now that the hard realities of government face us all. That too many in the past have become cynical and and world-weary. I ask all of you to hold on to the belief that our cause was just and honourable, that we can change the world, and that change will start today, in just over an hour, in fact. I thank you all for your unending and tireless work. Now the real job begins, and we are going to improve the lives of everyone in this great country of ours, for today, for tomorrow, and for the future. And now, from this nation's first ever female vice president, a few words. Terry Ann Baker. Thank you, Mr. President Elect. But not for long now, I think. (laughs) I just wanted to say what an unbelievable privilege it has been to be part of this historic adventure. To be involved in a time when our country has turned such a corner. When opportunity is no longer relied on color, creed, or gender, I feel honored to have been part of such a noble enterprise. To be vice president to a man like Harrison Doyle, I cannot put it into words. (laughs) I hope that both our teams can successfully work together. There should be no interstaff rivalry. We are all part of showing a united front, and, dare one say it, making a little bit of history. What we do today, what you are all part of, people will speak of for the rest of their lives. When you leave this room, you are this nation's government, and you must act and present yourselves at all times in the highest of ethical standards. If you do not, it will ultimately reflect back on me, the President, and yourself. You will either be part of the greatest administration our country has ever seen, or you will squander a moment in history, unlikely ever to be revisited. The choice is yours. So, let the journey begin. Let's see where it takes us. Agent Marshall. Yes, sir. Uh, Could you have the agents clear the room for a few minutes? I'd like to discuss something with the vice president-elect. I'm not supposed to leave you, sir. I'm not the president yet. But you will be very soon, sir. Then you can dictate to me, Agent Marshall. We'll clear the room for you, sir. Thank you. Madam Vice President. Mr. President. Don't ever do that again. Do what, Mr. President? You know very well. I told you at the beginning that I intended to win. That's not what I meant. Your team of incompetence threatened to throw it all away on numerous occasions. In fact, I was surprised, Mr. President, why you kept so many of them hanging around. Too many times the story became the latest overheard conversation of staffers, and not the statements that we were trying to put out. My team are my affair. I don't have to justify their actions to you. Even if they threaten the administration? This administration hasn't even started yet. Well, thank the Lord, Mr. President, because there are members of your team that shouldn't be here. (sighs) If you had fired several of them at the beginning, as I suggested, they would have screamed and shouted, but then that would have been an end to it. They would have been out, and the damage to the campaign would have been dissipated very quickly. Now that we're here in Washington, and they are part of your staff... When they foul up, which they will, the damage will be on us all. Huh, me, you mean? No more meetings behind closed doors. No more secret talks. What? No more policy on the fly. No more gathering of staffers around to discuss how to save the world. Hey, I gave my time to those who gave theirs. I was running for the highest office in the land. I had to make them feel special. But respectfully remember that the next time you decide to have a late-night meeting with advisors, I don't want to learn it from a drunk in the bar. What? Who? Dan Rutherford. You didn't give him the job he wanted, or even the job he expected. Oh, it... it wouldn't look wrong. He wanted to be on a new energy task force. 
I had appointed a chairman, as you know, committee members. They are all oh, younger than him. He would have looked out of place. He would have looked old. He is old. I consider the subcommittee. And? He still looked old. And he said he got you into the White House, and now you wouldn't repay the favor. Don't look at me like that, Terry Ann. I feel bad enough as it is. Dan's been with me since the beginning. Dan stayed when others turned their backs. Just because you rose, it doesn't necessarily follow that he would be dragged up as well. I, I think he took it bad. Actually, he, he took it very bad. And old men, they can be so indiscreet in their cups. That's the expression, isn't it? In their cups? Every time we make a decision, we upset someone, don't we? And when we've upset enough, we'll be out. Dan blames you for Tommy's death. And we will have to deal with that at some point. The telephone records show that the number he rang just before his death was a cheap disposable bought almost a year earlier from a street vendor. The phone company hasn't even cancelled the unit. Tommy died at his own hand, if you remember while acting as a bag man for illegal arms sales. We, I, know he spoke to someone just before he shot himself. And I know who I suspect. And I'm suspecting as president, I only have to pick up the phone and talk to the Attorney General. Yeah, but secrets only become a problem if they come out into the open. Tell me one political secret that with time did not come out. The airing of dirty laundry in public has been the fall of many leaders. But only if the world comes to hear of it. And how do you stop that happening? Oh, I'm sure we could always start a war somewhere. Where did you meet him? During the transitional meetings, just after you offered him sport. Well, I've not seen him since. Dan thinks I had something to do with Tommy's death. I know. It's crazy. Well, I know that. You know that. I think Dan knows that. It makes you wonder what he's really after. He's after what everyone is after. A seat at the table, a place in the limelight, a moment in history. We all want to be remembered, you mean? Whoever wants to be forgotten. And Dan? Dan mentioned uh, foreign policy. <laughs> Dan's never been out of the States. Dan gets travel sick crossing the Hudson. But there was this one time I remember. He was talking about the Middle East. He probably just wanted to travel. Who can blame him? Everyone would like a trip on Air Force One. I'll see what I can do. He wasn't after the complimentary coffee, Mr. President. And don't you find that when you're looking out of the airplane windows at 30,000 feet, no matter where you are, it always looks the same. But one's perception changes. When a person is out of the political scene, one so easily forgets why certain decisions were made in the first place. Sometimes a neutral voice needs to remind them of the things they once knew. Like they say... Your friends are either on your side... Or they're no longer your friends. What else did he say? Dan did a lot of talking. And a lot of drinking. He can knock that stuff back, can't he? I said i If he talks about your plans for the Middle East... <sighs> Peace in that region of the world has been the dream of many that ended the White House. But it has proved elusive. Now, there are certain groups in certain parts of the world that like the status quo as it is. They will not take well to a new president telling them how to do business. There are groups here that will never forgive you for even trying. This is a lose-lose, Mr. President. No, Madam Vice President. It's history in the making. It is what politics is about. It is what this administration is going to be about. We won't be just one more punch of policy wonks that came into the office full of dreams just to leave with little to show for it but frustration and bitterness. We are going to restore this nation's image in the eyes of the world.